Hello, and thank you for viewing my presentation. My name is Eddie Tiernan, and I am a PhD student at the University of Texas at Austin, working with Dr. Ben Hodges. As a preface to my presentation, I'm going to talk about the work that our research group has done trying to bring an extremely popular civil engineering modeling software, the EPA Stormwater Management Model, or SWIM, into the 21st century. In the past, speedups in software performance have largely been driven by processors becoming faster. These days, processors aren't necessarily becoming faster. Instead, computers are becoming more parallelized. Not all software sees performance benefit from increasingly parallelized computers, including EPA's SWIM. So we are attempting to create a new SWIM engine that better utilizes parallel computing potential. This presentation addresses a major hurdle my group has encountered in parallelizing the types of network types of networks common in SWIM, broadly categorized as flow networks. This hurdle is how do you intelligently choose which portions of your system will be analyzed by a single processor? It is worth noting that although this algorithm was designed within the specific context of urban water drainage, other domains can benefit from the lessons we've learned here. Electrical circuits, transportation, and water distribution systems can also be thought of as flow networks, thereby benefiting from the partitioning algorithm I will present. A quick detour to acknowledge my funding source, the National Center for Infrastructure Management and Modeling, the group that I am a part of, is on an EPA grant to produce the next generation swim engine, and I've added the disclaimer that the EPA hasn't reviewed this presentation and isn't culpable for anything I might say. Also, this work is in the stage is in the final stages of preparation for submission to the ASCE Journal of Computing and Civil Engineering. So I'd appreciate if you didn't take any photos or screen captures of the remainder of the presentation. Just a quick overview of this presentation. I am going to describe applications of partitioning in other fields before talking about why flow networks are different and in some aspects more challenging than other part uh, parallelization contexts common in the field of computer science and engineering more broadly. Then I'll introduce a novel partitioning algorithm, which I've named BIPQuick, and apply it to a large case study. Parallelization of engineering software came first to the domain of computational fluid dynamics, which you can see on the left here. In a gridded system like this, parallelization and partitioning just means dividing up your problem among processors, so each processor is essentially solving a smaller problem. The trade-off for what you get in speed, however, is that there are now boundary zones where you have to send information back and forth between processors. Inter-processor communication is far more time costly than intra-processor communication. For CFD, there's not a ton of partitioning optimization you can do. Each grid cell has a certain number of neighbors, as defined by a regular, predictable adjacency matrix. Sparse networks, on the other hand, like those describing connections between pages on the internet, are characterized by an irregular adjacency matrix, and partitioning gets much more interesting in this case. By partitioning, I'm referring to the decision about which parts of the system to assign to which processors for analysis. The partitioning optimization problem has two pretty straightforward objective functions. The first is that you want to minimize the number of cross-communications that are needed to solve your entire system, because cross-communications take time and bog a simulation down. The other is that you want the work allotted to each processor to be as balanced as possible. It doesn't help to limit yourself to one connection point if most of your network is being solved by a single processor. That's essentially just re-serializing your code. Optimized partitioning for a sparse network has been classified as an NP-complete problem, which for practical purposes means that we know that an optimal solution exists, but it is prohibitively difficult to find and prove that it is the global optimum. Myriad heuristic algorithms have been created to approximate the, opt the optimal partition for a sparse network. Engineering flow networks, think water drainage or water distribution, clearly look more like an information network than they do a CFD grid. They have sparse and irregular adjacency matrices that necessitate careful partitioning. But we will see that there are characteristics of flow networks that make them resistant to partitioning by the same methods that are useful for partitioning an information network. So flow networks are different. The first instance of flow networks being different that I'm going to uh, present is this idea of a power law, where information networks, sometimes called natural graphs, have a characteristic power law relationship. Basically what I mean by that is that the probability that any node in your information network has at least k connections declines according to an inverse power function. Many algorithms for addition this kind of network, like Google's famous PageRank algorithm for example, work by looking for the highly connected hotspots in the system and subdividing from there. 
the problem for engineered flow networks is they don't follow this power law. For an engineered system with 10,000 nodes, the power law relationship would expect there to be a handful of nodes with at least 1,000 connections. Can you imagine a manhole that has 1,000 pipe connections? That doesn't exist anywhere on Earth. So those algorithms tend to fail if the highly connected nodes just don't exist. Next is an example of how flow networks are different based on their elements, and that is that flow networks tend to be link dominated. So another difference for flow networks as compared to information networks is what the link node elements actually signify. For flow networks, the links actually constitute a more computationally significant element than the nodes do. So algorithms that emphasize partitioning based on the nodes don't adequately capture the computational load contributed by the links between them. Another common algorithm strategy, recursive bisection, works by iteratively subdividing a system into smaller and smaller pieces. But these algorithms fail when faced with disproportionately long links. Think of pipes bringing water either to or from an urban center. These disproportionately long links show up time and again in flow networks and are very difficult to handle by the algorithms that we currently have. I've included this slide to show what an alternative to intelligent partitioning is, essentially a plausible worst case scenario. That worst case scenario is that the system is labeled arbitrarily and no partitioning algorithm is used. What happens in this case is that the system is still parallelized, but based on the arbitrary labeling of the system. This partitioning strategy yields sections that are highly interconnected, which is what we don't want. Because there are very few partitioning algorithms that are designed to accommodate the quirks of flow networks, this arbitrary partitioning is the default condition unless we design something better. This brings us to the objective of our flow network partitioning algorithm, which I've named BIPQuick. The objective is to reduce the amount of cro process or cross-communication that needs to occur for parallel simulation of an arbitrary flow network. We do that by approximating the minimization of this constrained objective function in the top left that mathematically expresses the two objective functions I referenced earlier. In words, we seek to minimize the number of nodes that exist as boundaries between multiple parts while ensuring that the size is consistent across each part. Part size I define here as being the length of length that exists within each part. In flow networks, the length of the length between nodes dominates the computational complexity. So this is a decent proxy for the comp computational complexity of each part. On this slide, I also define what I consider to be a useful metric for assessing the algorithm's performance. I assume that the amount of connectivity, that is, the number of nodes that exist on multiple parts, is related to both the size of the network as well as the number of parts sought by the partition. A good algorithm will scale much more closely with the number of parts sought than with the size of the system, as the number of parts is likely to be much, much smaller than the total number of elements in the system. A good algorithm then can be identified as that having a beta coefficient near zero. The way that BitQuick algorithm achieves a reduced connectivity metric is by using a process that I call branch-wise iterative partitioning, or the BIP in BitQuick. BIP works by identifying the upstream subsystem for every node and quantifying the size of that subsystem. Partitioning then becomes a search for a node with the correct size attribute. Once this node has been identified, the upstream subsystem is classified as a part. The algorithm then starts again with the remaining unpartitioned portion of the system. So what I mean by that is that each of the nodes that you can see in this example network has information about the links, the number of links and the length of those links that flow through that node. And by doing that, we can say that each of these nodes has information about the system that exists upstream of that node. And then you're really just looking for the node that has the correct size of subsystem. So to carry this example further, we can say that in the example on the right, we are attempting to partition this 18 link network into three segments. Assuming each length is of the same length, that means we are looking for a node with six upstream links. First, the red system is identified as a part and then is removed from the system. Then we can look at the remainder of the system and identify the blue subsystem as being the next subsystem of the correct size. And finally, the green subsystem remainder is assigned to the last part. This yields a reduced connectivity metric relative to the same system on the left, partitioned on the basis of the link names. To see how BipQuick performs on a large flow network, we choose the Guadalupe San Antonio River Basin as a case study. This network comprises 5,500 kilometer area 
of, tech, of Central Texas and contains around 70,000 computational elements. It is worth noting that the river network is named using the USGS Comedy classification, which is less arbitrary than other naming conventions. So we can expect the partitioning based on the Comedy name will perform better than, say, a random sort. This slide shows visually what happens when we attempt to partition the Guadalupe San Antonio River Basin into three parts under each condition. The first condition represents the worst case scenario, an arbitrarily labeled system that yields quite poor connectivity, as we can see. Uh, the second condition is a system partitioned using the relatively logical COMID river names. And then a system, the third condition is a system partitioned using BIPQIC. And topologically, it's the same system in each of these cases. It's just partitioned using a different strategy each time. If we zoom onto this section, we can get a closer look at the differences between the three partition strategies. In the random sort case, we can see that each river section is attributed to a different part irrespective of its neighbors which is obviously about as bad as you can get. In the comedy sort, we can see that the primary river path was named in such a way to ensure that it would be grouped together, but some of the upstream minor branches were not included in this named grouping. And that is represented by the different colors of uh, the system that you can see. BitQuick, however, gives more weight to the topology of the system than its hydrology. In that way, it is able to correctly cloister river reaches that are topologically closely related. Perform the scaling analysis to see just how well BIPQIC is actually performing. We assess each of the partitioning strategies on the basis of our connectivity metric. We divided the single Guadalupe San Antonio River Basin system into uh, a different number of partitions with k equal to 2, 5, 10, 50, 100, and 500. And by keeping the number of the nodes constant for being a single system, we can identify a trend line between the connectivity on the basis of the number of parts sought and then elucidate a beta value for each of the partitioning strategies from this. So this slide and this figure graphically represents the table from the previous slide. We can see that the worst case partitioning strategy when the system's links are labeled arbitrarily is truly horrible. We can see that in black. The connectivity quickly saturates at the number of nodes in the system. The COMID naming convention, on the other hand, yields a much better partition, with the connectivity scaling more closely with the number of parts sought than the size of the system. However, the BIPQIC algorithm performs even this meticulous naming convention with a preliminary beta value of 0.08. So a few comments real quick on how to interpret this beta term. Network partitioning is currently an MP-complete problem, meaning we know that every system has an optimal solution, but it is not yet known how many operations it takes to find that final solution. Another implication in this particular context is that it's not known how close to zero the beta term can be for uh, an optimal partition strategy. This analysis is ongoing. I have several other large network systems that I would like to compare to the Guadalupe uh, River Basin case study, where using the different sizes of the systems, we can vary uh, both the number of parts sought and the size of the system, thereby reinforcing uh, our beta values. Some final comments. Um, we can see that from some preliminary analysis, BIPQIC outperforms an arbitrarily labeled large system, which is what we were hoping that it would do. Um, for some broader use, BIPQIC is written in both Python, Python 3 and Fortran, and I'm working on packaging the code uh, for the public. And in addition to working on tree structure networks like the one I presented in the case study, BIPQIC can also handle um, multiple outlets, cross connections, complex junctions, all node link element types that exist in SWIM and disconnected systems. That's a future uh, endeavor. I haven't written the code yet, but I understand how it would fit into um, the BitQuick workflow. You know, I designed BitQuick to be a general algorithm for flow networks. So I was, I've been hoping to, in the future, near future, apply it to other flow network models, such as EPANet. We have members in our group working with EPANet. So I'd love to be able to show parallelized benefit of EPANet modeling for the use of BitQuick as well. The future work, I need to finish integrating BitQuick into the Swim Engine workflow, uh, where it essentially acts as a pre-processing step 
uh, between the SWIM input file and the computational engine. And this is how BIPQuick is intended to be for any parallel uh, parallelization simulation, parallelized simulation, excuse me, is, it is a preprocessor that restructures the network's arrays uh, into ones that can be you know, regularly partitioned and not lose, um, and not be penalized on the speed up for that reason. Uh, what I also need to do in the future is show the computational benefit of BIPQuick on the actual engine, because right now it's just a hypothesis that a well-partitioned system will outperform a poorly partitioned system, but I haven't yet been able to show that that is true. And finally, I'd just like to acknowledge um, a few people that have helped make this work possible. Uh, my advisor, Dr. Ben Hodges, um, the US EPA, and NSIM for my funding, and then uh, Isan and Gerardo in my group who have helped me out quite a bit. Um, thank you, guys.